The D7 is a robot vacuum from Neato Robotics. We tore down a D7 to see how it navigated around rooms and recharged itself. One way the D7 maneuvers around is with mechanical switches that serve as obstacle detectors when the robot bumps into something. These switches are actuated by a portion of the robot's top cover that is free to move when the robot hits an obstacle. There are also magnetic sensors on the front of the D7 that can sense magnetic tape that the robot owner places in areas the robot needs to stay away from. And there are optical sensors around the edge of the robot pointed at the floor. These sensors detect when the robot has come up to the edge of the floor as at the top of a staircase so the D7 doesn't go tumbling down the stairs. The D7's main cover comes off by removing a few torque screws. It holds the dustbin and an air filter for the air output. Removing the top cover reveals the main electronics boards at the front of the bot as well as the LiDAR unit and mounts for the various sensors and motors. The D7 has a Wi-Fi interface to communicate directly with cloud servers for setup count information and robot commands. The Wi-Fi chip sits on the main circuit board, which is visible near the front of the vacuum. The main processor on the D7 is a Texas Instruments chip with a non-standard part number. Researchers in Germany who analyzed security aspects of the D7 report the MCU is actually a custom AM335X Citera processor chip with secure boot enabled, meaning the D7's flash chip, 4 gigabyte NAND device from Kingston Technology, only contains an encrypted system image, meaning physical attackers can't unsolder it to get at the robot software. The main PCB also contains a level shifting circuitry and charge management ICs for the robot's 14.4 volt battery. A point to note is that the battery charge management takes place on the PCB, not in the external charger to which the D7 docks for recharge. The charging connection consists of two horizontal metal bars sitting at the back of the robot in the exhaust outlet. To recharge, the robot backs itself into the charging dock, so the two metal bars touch two large metal contacts on the docking station. There's also a rectifier connected across the robot's two metal charging contacts, which is probably there to protect against accidental cross-wiring during recharge. There are six DC motors on the vacuum, one spinning the LiDAR, one running the side brush, one spinning the main brush, one for each of the two driven wheels, and finally, the fan motor and they all operate at 14.4 volts. Three of the motors operate at variable speed and apparently use speed feedback for a speed control loop. These motors use a feedback device that is a magnetic disc mounted on the motor shaft and a Hall effect sensor. Putting ferrofluid over top one of the encoder wheels shows eight magnetic poles. Thus, the Hall sensor detects motor shaft rotation, every 45 degrees. There are two motor drive ICs on the main PCB that most likely handle the individual motors on the two main wheels. But there's no motor driver IC for the other speed control motor spinning the main brush. Here's the likely reason. The main wheel motors must not only change speed, but also go in reverse. The motor driver chips make possible the two directional operation. In contrast, though the main brush motor spins at different speeds, it always spins in the same direction. Its drive signals are simple enough that the Citara MCU can generate them directly. Basically, the MCU monitors the brush speed feedback loop and generates a pulse width modulated signal that determines the motor speed. The motors for the two main wheels use a two-axis gear train that provides torque multiplication while also moving the axis of motion so the output is not in direct line with the motor axis. The output gear meshes with teeth on the inner diameter of the D7 wheels. Both drive wheels have a simple suspension system consisting of a coil spring in compression positioned between the wheel assembly and the robot chassis. The point of the suspension system is to let the robot travel over uneven surfaces, as for example moving from bare floor to a rug. 
When the robot wheels are completely off the ground, the springs are completely extended. And when they're fully extended, a micro switch detects the situation and signals the D7 processor that the robot is off the ground and can't move. Finally, the fan in the D7 that generates the vacuum suction, made by Delta Electronics in China, is also a variable speed fan. However, it appears the D7 runs it only at the fan's top speed. That brings us to the LiDAR unit. It sits on a PCB positioned over top the centrifugal fan. Central to the unit is a laser diode and an optical line sensor. Both sit in a plastic mount which holds them at a fixed angle to each other so the sensor field of view intersects the laser diode beam. We measured the point of intersection using rulers and triangles and found it to be a bit more than two feet from the plastic mount. A point to note about the D7's LiDAR is that it scans the scene around it in a single plane at the height of the optical line sensor and laser diode. This contrasts with LiDAR used on vehicles with autonomous driving features where the LiDAR can see objects in a two-dimensional area. Because the D7 LiDAR is limited to a single plane and because it works best for objects that are about two feet from the robot, the LiDAR function is quite limited. That also explains why the D7 needs about a dozen other sensors in addition to its LiDAR to keep it from getting stuck or getting lost. The entire LiDAR module and all its electronics spins while the robot operates. Thus, the D7 must get the LiDAR data off the spinning platform and back to the MCU somehow. The usual way of making electrical connections to a spinning platform is through a slip ring. Interestingly, the D7 LiDAR doesn't use a slip ring. To get power to the LiDAR unit, the D7 uses an inductive pickup. AC power feeds to a fixed coil at the base of the LiDAR module. The spinning LiDAR unit contains another coil concentric to the fixed coil. As the unit spins, AC is induced in the spinning coil that is rectified to DC by four diodes and a capacitor on the LiDAR board. To handle communication between the spinning LiDAR board and the rest of the robot without a slip ring, the D7 uses LEDs and optical sensors. The PCB is affixed to the bottom of the housing that holds the LiDAR motor and spinning platform. This PCB serves as a central attachment point for several of the robot subsystems, but also contains a single LED and photo detector sitting at the center of the power transfer coil. The two devices form an optical communication link to the PCB attached to the laser diode photo detector housing. Another LED photo detector pair on this board form the other half of the optical link. On both ends of the link, a dual comparator IC from Texas Instruments seems to handle pulse shaping of the optical signals for use by downstream electronics. The main components on the spinning LiDAR board is a Texas Instruments 32-bit MCU and a linear photodiode array that picks up the laser diode reflections. There are no markings on the linear photodiode array, but it sits on a 40-pin package. If it uses an architecture similar to that of most commercial photodiode arrays, the pin count implies that it contains about 35 photodiodes. Finally, we'll say a few words about the D7's docking station for battery recharging. It contains two metal contact bars that are spring-loaded. The docking station internals consist of just a switching power supply. The controller IC is from ABOV Semiconductor in South Korea and seems to be a non-standard part. One point to note about the power supply board is that it contains an optocoupler to isolate the high-voltage AC part of the circuit from the DC secondary. An understandable precaution for a device that sits in a living room with two bare metal bars. And that's about it for the Neato D7. For more teardown videos like this one, go to eeworldonline.com.